The War of the Ring often gets simplified into a battle of good versus evil, and to be fair, from an outside point of view, that is mostly true. But many of the men who fought on the side of evil viewed themselves as the good guys, and this matches no one better than the Dunlendings, who fought against Rohan on the side of Isengard. The Dunlendings had a long history, and were often on the receiving end of perceived injustices from not just the forces of evil, but also the forces of good. So in this video, we go through their history and determine whether the Dunlendings were villains, or whether they were victims. The Dunlendings were unique in the regard that although they fought on the same side as Sauron during the War of the Ring, they did not fight for Sauron himself. They fought for Saruman and had no other allegiances. Their decision to side with Saruman didn't come from a devotion to some dark religion, but rather from what they believed to be historical injustices against their people. As I said earlier, the Dunlendings had a long history. They shared common ancestors with the second house of the Adain, who were known as the Haladin or the House of Halef in Beleriand. But just like the other houses of the Adain, only a minority ever actually entered Beleriand, and the rest of them settled across the wide lands of Middle-earth. In the case of these Haladin, who were known as Pre-Numenorians, they mostly settled the lands of Southern Eriador, and the lands that would later be known as Gondor. Unlike their cousins in Beleriand, these Pre-Numenorians seemed to have a relatively peaceful First Age. But life as they know it would change early in the Second Age. In the year 600, the Numenorians would first return to Middle-earth, meeting the Men of Eriador in the Tower Hills. Now, the Men of Eriador were different to the Pre-Numenorians. They were largely related to the First and Third Houses of the Adain, the Baorians and the Hadorians. The Numenorians were almost entirely descended from these two houses, so the two groups actually spoke a similar language. After all, Adunaic, the language of the Numenorians, was the descendant of the language known as Talisca, which the ancient Baorians and the Hadorians spoke. The Numenorians recognised their close kinship with the men of Eriador, and the meeting was a success. A little over a hundred years later, the Numenorians, often led by the famous mariner Prince Aldarion, made contact with the pre-Numenorians in the land known as Enedwaif. These meetings went poorly. The Haladin never spoke Talisca, and the language they used was entirely unrelated, so the Numenorians did not recognise any kinship. Instead, they regarded the pre-Numenorians as primitive and categorised them as men of darkness, men who had served Morgoth. They gave them the name Gwaifurim, which roughly translated to Shadow People in Sindarin. On the other hand, the Gwaifurim viewed the Numenorians with awe. Believe it or not, things did not get any better from there. As Numenorian maritime culture grew, so did their need for lumber for their ships. They couldn't deforest Numenor, so the next best place to harvest lumber from was the vast forests that covered Enedwaif and Minhiriath at that time, forests that the Gwaifurim called home. Naturally, the Gwaifurim did not take kindly to this, and when the Numenorean deforestation became out of hand, the Gwaifurim became hostile. Armed conflict broke out between the two sides, and the Gwaifurim would ambush the Numenorians when they could. In response, the Numenorians became even more aggressive in their felling of trees, and began to purposely neglect planting new ones. By 1200 of the Second Age, the Numenorians would begin properly colonising Middle-earth, at the mouth of the river Guaflo, they would found the port of Londaire, giving them a base to push their lumber yards further inland. Sometime after this, the Gwaifurim would mostly abandon their native lands. Some would flee into the forest later known as Erin Vaughan, and others would flee into the foothills of the Misty Mountains, and would become the ancestors of the modern Dunlendings. Thus, when the War of the Elves and Sauron began in 1693 of the Second Age, the Gwaifurim actually welcomed Sauron's arrival because they believed that he would drive the Numenorians from the continent. Sauron did not turn down their aid, but his chief concern was with the Elves, and he did not have the strength to assault the Numenorians at Londaire. Guided by the natives, his raiders would instead burn down Numenorian supply depots wherever they could find them. This had the maybe unexpected, or maybe totally expected consequence, of setting fire to the remaining forests. By the time the war ended in 1700, most of the forests of Southern Eriador had been burned to the ground by Sauron or felled by the Numenorians. The ancient home of the Gwaifurim was gone. Unfortunately for the pre-Numenorians, their pain was just beginning. Many of those in the east who lived in the White Mountains or in the lands that would become Gondor turned to worshipping the dark. They were subjugated or driven away by the Numenorians, and even enslaved during Numenor's final days. 
the infamous Men of the Mountains received the worst fate of all. Originally followers of Melkorism, they pledged allegiance to Isildur, only to betray him afterwards, and for that they were cursed. We know how their tale goes. Our attention now turns solely to the ancestors of the Dunlendings. Although Dunlending was a Rohiric word that wasn't used until thousands of years later, we're just going to call them that anyway. For the rest of the Second Age, the Dunlendings live in isolation, presumably playing little part in events as Numenorean influence across Middle-earth increases. At the end of the Second Age, with the founding of the Numenorean realms in exile, the region of Anadwaif, which included the land of Dunland, would fall under control of Gondor. That being said, Gondorian influence in the region was limited to the town of Tharbad, and patrols whose job it was to maintain the north-south road. So while the Dunlendings technically lived in Gondor, they weren't exactly Gondorian subjects as far as we know. Despite the Dunlendings' hatred of the Numenorians, there isn't really any evidence that suggests that they were openly hostile to Gondor. Although they weren't on friendly terms, their relationship had definitely cooled down. There seems to have been limited contact between the two groups, as when the Great Plague struck, Dunland was still affected, suggesting that maybe the Dunlendings traded along the north-south road. After the Great Plague, Gondor withdraws from Anadwaif. This results in the Dunlendings slowly but surely resettling the lands around Dunland, especially southwards, towards the Gondorian province of Kalanadon. The Gondorian population in Kalanadon had been steadily dwindling. Taking advantage of Gondor's waning control, the Dunlendings began to migrate across the Aizen, even peacefully merging with the ancient Gondorian garrison at Angrenost, later known as Isengard. At some later point, they kill the few guards who are still loyal to Gondor. For what it's worth, the stewards didn't seem to really care about this. At this point, it seems like things are finally on the up and up for the Dunlendings, but as it so often happens in Middle-earth, things got worse. In 2510, the Battle of the Field of Celebrant occurs, where an army of Aethiod saves an army of Gondorians. As a reward, Gondor gives the Aethiod the region of Kalanadon. It becomes Rohan, and the Aethiod become the Rohirrim. It doesn't take long for relations to sour between the Dunlendings and the Rohirrim. By the end of the reign of Rohan's third king, the Dunlendings have been completely driven out of Rohan. The two sides war numerous times over the next hundred years, culminating in the Long Winter, where Dunland is actually able to temporarily occupy Rohan, only to be defeated the following year. At the end of this war, Saruman moves into Isengard. As Saruman slowly descended into evil, he frequently allied with the Dunlendings, employing them and favouring them in their conflicts with Rohan. The rest is rather well-known history. During the War of the Ring, the Dunlendings would side with Saruman and would make up part of his army during the Battle of the Fords of Isen and the Battle of the Hornburg. They would be defeated, many Dunlendings would surrender, and the Rohirrim actually treated them rather mercifully. The peace terms were quite simple. The Dunlendings were never to cross the Isen in force again. Okay, that's a relatively brief history of the Dunlendings. I know it's gone for almost nine minutes, but unfortunately, these are the kinds of things we have to do for the rest of the video to make sense. If you've been paying attention, you probably noticed two important features of Dunlending history. One, it wasn't exactly a nice time, and two, they were often screwed over by other peoples. Let's go through some of these events in a little more detail and explain how exactly the Dunlendings were affected. When it came to the Numenorians, the Dunlendings were victims of what can only be described as racist labelling. Labelling that wasn't even correct. They were deemed to be men of darkness, therefore their lands were fit for exploitation and environmental vandalism on account of them being ancient enemies of the Adai, which, like I said before, wasn't true. Keep in mind, the Dunlendings were not immediately hostile to the Numenorians, and only became hostile once the tree felling became devastating. Those are the exact words used. And when the Dunlendings had the audacity to be upset about the destruction of their land, the Numenorians responded by accelerating it. In this situation, the Dunlendings were absolutely the victims and had every right to be angry with the Numenorians. They were, really, just defending their land. Okay, but then they sided with Sauron, right? And yes, siding with Sauron is never the right option, but you have to understand the Dunlending perspective. Firstly, they wouldn't have known who Sauron was or what he did. And secondly, for them, it was the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And I must stress that the Dunlendings only provided guides for Sauron, and only for the purpose of attacking the Numenorians. There is no mention of them providing actual military aid. 
In Sauron, they saw an opportunity to drive the Numenorians back into the sea and reclaim their land, which is admirable goals from their perspective. But unfortunately for them, this backfired and it led to the complete destruction of their ancient forests. In this case, the Dunlendings were collateral damage in a game that was far beyond their understanding, and were once again the victims. What about their conflicts with the Rohirrim? There is a little more nuance to this one, and it comes from viewing both perspectives. From the Dunlending perspective, the Rohirrim were Northmen invaders who were driving them out of lands that they now regarded as their own, on account of living there for centuries without objection from Gondor. But from the perspective of the Rohirrim, the Dunlendings were illegal occupiers of land that had been lawfully ceded to them. Both sides had a valid claim, but both sides were also responsible for the 500 year conflict that ensued. At different points in history, both the Rohirrim and the Dunlendings were the aggressor, invading each other's lands on multiple occasions. And finally, what about siding with Saruman? Well, once again, from the Dunlending perspective, Saruman came across as a genuine ally, something that they had never really had during their time in Middle-earth. And in the early days, while Saruman still maintained an image of good, you can't blame the Dunlendings for siding with him, especially when he favoured them over the Rohirrim. However, I'm not going to claim the Dunlendings were victims in this either. They chose to remain loyal to Saruman even when he had clearly fallen to evil, and they willingly took the field alongside orcs. So we can see a pattern emerge from the history of the Dunlendings. They're happy doing their own thing. They come into contact with foreign invaders, the foreign invaders screw them over, the Dunlendings side with an evil force to combat them, and then they lose and end up right back where they started, or in an even worse position. I also want to make something else clear. The Dunlendings weren't vicious barbarians, sort of how they're portrayed in Peter Jackson's films. They had contact with people other than the Numenorians and the Rohirrim. The Stores, a subgroup of hobbits, actually dwelt in Dunland for several hundred years and picked up many Dunlendish words, implying that there was peaceful contact between the peoples. Likewise, upon losing Erebor to Smaug, dwarves actually dwelt in Dunland for a period of 32 years before eventually moving to Ered Luwin so the Dunlendings could absolutely be accommodating to outsiders. Even when it came to the Numenorians and the Rohirrim, the Dunlendings weren't always hostile. This is demonstrated by the mixing of their peoples. As I said earlier, the Gondorian guards at Isengard gradually mixed with the Dunlendings that had taken up residence in the surrounding valley. And in the case of the Rohirrim, the region of Westmarch was made up of many people of mixed Rohirric Dunlendish blood. So despite the intense rivalries, they still had periods of peaceful interactions. But this is important. I don't want to come across like I'm whitewashing the Dunlendings, and while they definitely can come across as victims of history, their villainous acts shouldn't be forgotten, nor should they be downplayed. Siding with the forces of evil, whether it be Sauron or Saruman, can never truly be justified. Even if the Dunlendings were ignorant of their true nature and their true plans, it should become fairly obvious that you're fighting for the wrong side once you end up fighting alongside orcs against fellow men. Their hatred of specific peoples no matter how justified they feel it is, is not an excuse to side with forces whose goal is complete tyranny over Middle-earth and the enslavement or genocide of forces that oppose them. It also shouldn't be forgotten that the Dunlendings were participants in some truly horrific deeds, things that cannot be excused by their rough history. In advancing Saruman's nefarious designs, the Dunlendings were willing collaborators, even stooping to lows such as aiding Saruman in his creation of half-orcs and goblin men and probably the Urukai as well. I don't even want to think about how that happened. And in the scouring of the Shire, it's assumed that most of Saruman's ruffians were of Dunlending origin, and they helped subjugate and exploit the hobbits, a peaceful folk who had never wronged them. There isn't any historical justification for that. Taking all of this into account, it's very easy to argue that the Dunlendings were victims of the twists and turns of history. But at the same time, it's also very easy to argue that the hardships they endured did not justify some of their actions and helped paint them as villains. Ultimately, they were a complex people with a complex history, and that history played a very important role in their actions. In many ways, they were definitely victims of greed, of racism, of violence from both good and evil, but in some ways, they were villains obsessed with revenge and willing to go to extreme lengths to claim it. Personally, I think the Dunlendings are one of the most underrated parts of the Legendarium. They were relatively normal people who would have been happy staying in their ancient forests, but had the misfortune of constantly being on the wrong side of history and caught between forces beyond their understanding. And their history demonstrates that the forces of good weren't so one-dimensional, 
and were definitely capable of committing evil of their own, something that is often forgotten in Tolkien's universe. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it or at least found it interesting. I've been wanting to do a proper video on the Dunlendings for a long time because, well, as my video may have just proved, I think they're slightly misunderstood. They're often lumped in with the forces of evil, and I feel like that needs further elaboration. Cheers again, farewell, and remember, Dunland is Funland, brought to you by the Dunland Department of Tourism.